Welcome back to Black News Tonight. It is an honor to spend this evening talking about the life and the legacy of Malcolm X, who was a human rights leader, a devout Muslim, and someone known for generations now as the singular, perhaps, figure, the, if not the singular, certainly one of the most significant uh, representations of black uh, manhood, one of the significant representations of black revolutionary possibility, and really one of the most significant leaders of the 20th century. Joining me to help me think through all of this are three incredibly brilliant guests. I have uh, Dr. Maitha El Hassan, who is also the co-executive producer for the hit series Rami. We have history editor of Sapolo Square, Zahir Ali, and we have student minister Dr. Wesley Muhammad from the Nation of Islam research team. Thank you all three for joining me. Uh, Dr. Wesley, I'm going to start with you. Um, we just had a conversation with uh, Brother Abdurrahman Muhammad, and, and we, we sort of ended the conversation talking about the significance of the Nation of Islam on Malcolm X's life. Do you feel that that piece gets left out too often? Absolutely. I think the orthodox narrative of Malcolm X goes out of its way to minimize the impact of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad on the transformation of Malcolm X. Brother Malcolm, Minister Malcolm, was an autodidact in that he did study ferociously. He had a brilliant, brilliantly expansive mind, but he was self-transformative as much as the earth that revolves at 1,037 and one-third miles per hour, if it can travel without the light of the sun striking it, then it can be described as self-moving. The same way Malcolm's transformation was stimulated by the light of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad that struck him and set him on the course that the world rightly celebrates by recognizing and honoring his life today. Maytha, part of, I think, what we miss with the Malcolm X narrative, as it's often represented in Hollywood and in everyday speech, is this idea that Malcolm was doing bad Islam, hated white people, saw white Muslims, yeah. found good Islam, and then became something else. It's kind of a Disney-fied narrative that also plays into a kind of Arab-centric understanding of Islam. How, what are the dangers of thinking about Malcolm's narrative in that way? Yeah, excellent question. And it is a very prevalent narrative. I think uh, Dr. Wesley Muhammad did hit the nail on the head that that's the orthodox view of Malcolm that is very Disneyfied. It makes for a good novel, the, a good novel that became an autobiography as told to Alex Haley. So we have to remember that part, that somebody who specialized in constructing a novel, and I'm sure Zahir can speak in more detail to this, can um, use, use a... Um, use a vision of Malcolm that goes through the stages of transcending the race strictures of the nation of Islam. And that's actually absolutely not true. And I would throw to Zahir to posit his theory of Malcolm and the nation having a shattering as opposed to a break between each other. I'm in fact wearing a t-shirt that says, our objective is complete freedom, justice, and equality by any means necessary. That is a slogan that he got from the nation, freedom, justice, and equality. And it was so constant, even in his writings after the nation, that he wrote FJE as a reference point. So part of the nation as the shattering, the glass from the nation continued to be part of Malcolm's narrative. Um, and, and his vision of the world and his global politics. Malcolm did not leave black Americans astray when he went to Hajj and connected with global leaders in Africa and Asia and quote unquote Middle East. What he did do was continue to advocate for the victims, the 22 million victims of democracy. And that was a the center of what he was championing. And so that was, the nation was where he learned in great detail what it meant to have a vision of the world, of the quote unquote dark world, of an Afro-Asiatic world that is united around a certain kind of politics that resists yeah. white supremacy. So 
that's how we should understand outside of this Arab-centric narrative of a quote-unquote orthodox Islam that Malcolm now embraces, and now he is in the good Islam fold. Zahir, to what extent, though, did Malcolm play into that himself before we go to break? There's a, a way that Malcolm's autobiography kind of allows for that kind of a reading. You know, the book started out one way, right? Malcolm's telling a story about essentially how his life was saved by the nation. By the end, Malcolm has a different disposition. There's a lot going on. And he's kind of telling a different story. Does, does Malcolm's own self-story, his own self-narration make us misread him? Yeah, I think, you know, I agree certainly with what both Dr. Wesley Muhammad and Dr. Maythel Hassan have said. Um, Malcolm himself skillfully used these points of inflection in his life um, to signal breaks that he wanted to signal, uh, to signal to, for example, civil rights leaders. You know, when Malcolm uh, had the Hajj experience, he wrote um, the same letter to many, many people. Uh, he wanted them to get that letter. And he knew that by sharing that letter, it would hopefully open doors to him that he, quite frankly, had foreclosed earlier with his very, very strident criticisms of civil rights leaders. And so Malcolm himself, um, you know, fashioned his own life as a series of epiphanies and breaks. You know, he talked about the ways that he experienced an epiphany while in prison, and that caused him to shed Detroit Red. He talked about how he experienced an epiphany while going to uh, make the Hajj, and that allowed him to shed um, what he claimed was the, the sort of NOI legacy. But the truth of the matter is the person that was Detroit Red, the person that was Malcolm X, the person that was Malcolm Little, the person that was El Hajj Malik Shabazz was the same person, just in different circumstances. And so while we acknowledge the significant breaks in his life, you know, there is a core person that survives all of those transformations and they remain intact. And yeah. so I think, you know, that's something for Malcolm. And so I, I would just say that when we think about Malcolm's legacy, a lot of times we focus on what Malcolm said uh, or even what he did. And I think we should also include what Malcolm experienced. Right. So uh, the, the, mm. the history of that's Malcolm, not just I wanna, what I he said, is, I wanna... is part of that legacy. Absolutely. And that's a great point. I want y'all to stay with me. We got more to come after the break. We're talking Malcolm X and his life and his legacy. Stay with me. All right, we're back talking Malcolm X. And I'd like to talk about the ever-changing impact that Malcolm has had on politics, uh, activism, and culture. And back with me to discuss is history editor of Sapelo Square, Zahir Ali, student minister Dr. Wesley Muhammad of the Nation of Islam Research Team, and Dr. Maitha El Hassan, historian and co-executive executive producer of Rami. Uh, Maitha, I'm going to start with you. Uh, one of the things that's happening right now in the current moment is a really interesting connection between black folk here and around the world in terms of activism, in terms of solidarity. What role does Malcolm X play in helping us think internationally? Yeah, Malcolm and his quotes seem to be memified in this moment and circulated across the globe. So one in particular I'm seeing emerge with what's happening in Palestine and also was uh, reprised during the uprisings and protests to the murder of George Floyd last year was, if you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. And for Malcolm, he really was a very deep um, uh, theorist on systems of oppression globally. And the way that his words have resonated around Palestine and uprisings in the U.S. can be put into place everywhere because he did speak out on what was happening apartheid-wise in South Africa, the imperialist killing of Patrice Lumumba in Congo, um, Nkrumah's pan-Africanism. You know, he was so inspired by the Organization of African Unity and attended their conference in the summer of 1964 that he created an organization of African-American unity. So folks still see that today. I mean, he even is having some of his words on Palestine also reproduced in this moment, and people are starting to see and make the connections. One thing that's really interesting that um, maybe some folks haven't 
found out because it's in his diaries and not a lot of people have drawn attention to it is Malcolm X created what he imagined as an original inhabitants, an indigenous formula of folks that are connected by similar conditions of Western neocolonialism. And so he wrote out this sentence that merely said colonialism, imperialism, Zionism equals racism. And over colonialism, he wrote South Africa. Over imperialism, Congo. Over um, uh, Zionism, Palestine. And of course, over racism, the U.S. And this went into his article wow. on Zionism in September 1964 in the Egyptian Gazette. So Malcolm's understanding of the world was very decolonial and also rooted in an umic imperative and wrapped in a pan-African vision. Wow. Uh, Dr. Wesley, when we hear that kind of dynamic uh, understanding of Malcolm X, he's somebody who's growing, right? And when he gives a ballot or bullet, he's, he's expanding his vision of black nationalism. By the time he's giving message to the grassroots, he's talking about uh, a very clear, as, as Metha is talking about, right, this very clear internationalist vision that is understanding all these structures and powers. For a lot of folk, that means that Malcolm was growing and moving beyond the organization that birthed him. And of course, he'd already left the Nation of Islam. But I know you've argued that it's more complicated than that. You took the words right out of my mouth. I was about to start by saying it's much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. Though I appreciate the illustration that Brother Zahir Ali gives of the shattering of the relationship. But we must come to terms with the fact that there was prior to that fateful day, February 21st, 1965, there was an attempt to put the pieces back together between Malcolm X and the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. We have internal and external evidence of that fact. So we that certainly complicates the picture that Malcolm was on a unidirectional trajectory in terms of growth that once he left the Nation of Islam, he was done with everything Nation of Islam, but that is not the case. So we, we have to his internationalism. Of course, he first tasted it as ambassador for the Nation of Islam and in particular, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad in 1959, when he went throughout the Middle East Afri and Africa on behalf of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So yes, the Orthodox narrative is very convenient. It's very, I like your term, disnified, but the true narrative of Malcolm X is much more complex and complicated than that. Zahir, I'm going to give you the last word on this. What do you make of that assessment? I mean, there's there's obviously debates about this. Some argue Malcolm yeah. was trying to get back into the nation at the end. Some people argue uh, that Malcolm had severed his relationship with the nation. And there's lots of debates on this. And obviously, we can have y'all back to have more conversations. But where, where, where do you where do you sit with this? So I'll just I'll say that, you know, one of the reasons why I, I like the metaphor of the shattering is because and when something shatters, pieces of the thing is left behind and other pieces of the thing is taken with. And so um, there are many things about the Nation of Islam that Malcolm carried with him through till the very end. And there are many things about Malcolm that remained in the nation. I mean, for for uh, 12 years, he was in the Nation of Islam and he was a minister and he helped you know, create and develop these temples and the culture um, and, and, and represent a practical implementation of the teachings of the Nation of Islam. And so his um, his legacy is very much in the nation as much as the nation's legacy is in him. And I would say that that legacy more broadly when we step back is the history of the revival of Islam in the 20th century in Black America, which invited that internationalism, whether it was through the Ahmadi movement, whether it's through the Black Sunnis who embraced in the jazz, or whether it's the Nation of Islam or, or the Dar al-Islam or other later movements movements that came. So there was always this thread, or, or Noble Drew Ali with the Morris Science Temple created a framework that was outside the sort of domesticated understanding of who the quote unquote so-called American Negro was. So there's a, there's, you know, you situate all of these movements and all of these figures 
within that broader trend and you see that you see um you know the idea that that religion is supposed to liberate you is supposed to critique white supremacy um so all of these were commonalities in all of these movements and i think you know the um you know when we when we focus so singularly on individuals we lose sight of the communities that gave birth to them right and that these communities you know oh. were they were torn by these divisions and they had to make difficult choices but these were communities nonetheless who continued uh, the work, whether they remained in the nation or left the nation or were never in the nation, they reflected that same kind of drive as, as Metha said that Malcolm always upheld, um, which was freedom, justice, and equality. Ooh, brothers out here, I like the way you was moving on that answer. Well, I wish we had more time. I'd press you a little bit more on that. <laughs> that was like one of Malcolm Lindy hops. We're going to talk about it the next time I had y'all on the show. <laughs> Thank you all three for coming with me <laughs> on this journey to discuss Malcolm. Very brilliant and insightful comments as always. Coming up, there's even more on the life and legacy of Malcolm X.